morning. Welcome everyone to the Lord's house this morning. We trust the Lord will draw near to us today and minister to our house from this truth. I want to read some words from Psalm 57. The Psalm 57, and we read in the title that in this psalm David was fleeing from Saul. He was in a cave. The words of the verse 5 then are so instructive that a man that was hounded and persecuted, a man that was separated from loved ones, what was his desire? Verse 5, be thou exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let thy glory be above all the earth. And in verse 11, be thou exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let thy glory be above all the earth. And we are not in a cave this morning, but may our desire be, as was the desire of David, that the Lord will be exalted in our midst, that the Lord's name will be honoured in our gathering together today. We'll sing the Lord's face together, please, in prayer. Our gracious Father, we ask, O Lord, that today in our gathering that the Lord's name will be exalted. And we pray that man will be forgotten, that today our hearts will be led out after our great God, and that truly we will worship our great Lord. So grant us help in this at time we do pray to worship the right. We ask in our Lord's name. We're going to turn in our hymn books, please, to the hymn 114. The hymn 114 is found in the page 222. Christ the Lord is risen today. Hallelujah. Sons of men and angels say, Hallelujah. So it's the hymn 114, the hymn 114, and we'll stand as we sing these words.
will come before the Lord together again in prayer, please. And sit in the Lord's face together in prayer. Our gracious Father, we rejoice today in the resurrection of our great Savior. O oh Lord, we thank thee today we have not come to commemorate some prophet that has long since died and his body remained grave. We come today in this first day of the week rejoicing that Christ has risen triumphant. Death and hell have been defeated. O oh Lord, we rejoice today that we stand on the side of victory, that the Christian has been united to the one who is the victor, the one that through his death and resurrection has overcome. O oh Lord, we praise thee that there's coming that day when we will unite with him in completely crushing the serpent and all that opposes the things of God. And we thank thee that Satan is already a defeated adversary. And we thank thee that his power has been broken. But, O oh Lord, we thank thee for that coming day when his doom will be completely executed O oh Lord, we thank Thee for that coming day when Satan and all that he has deceived will be cast into the lake of fire forever and that righteousness will be completely demonstrated in our Saviour. O oh Lord, we thank Thee that our Saviour awaits that day and that the Father has said sit until I make thine enemies thy footstool O oh Lord we thank thee that there is a people being prepared a people made ready in the day of thy power and O oh Lord we thank thee that the Lord in our day is building his church that the gates of hell cannot prevail against it. And we pray today that the work of God in this place will continue to be built. And we pray for a building up of the saints of God, that we will today be drawn closer to thee, that today there will be evident growth in grace in our lives. And, O oh Lord, we do pray that you will today work in the hearts of those that are not converted as yet. O oh Lord, bring the lost, we pray, unto thyself. And so we pray today that there will be rejoicing not only in this company, but rejoicing in heaven over sinners brought unto thyself. O oh Lord, have mercy upon this city. How may we see departure from the things of God on every side how we see the lovely name of our Lord Jesus maligned. And we cry to thee for times of refreshing. And we cry to thee, O Lord, that we will see that out of the multitudes of sinful men, uh, people drawn to thyself, make us to be uh, a company that see the Lord at work in the salvation precious souls. We pray for the transformation of homes. We pray, Lord, that through the ministry in this house, that we will see the kingdom of God being advanced. So, Lord, we commend this time to thee to come among us, we pray. And we pray that through our gathering this morning, that our hearts will be prepared for the seasons of prayer today. And we pray to thee as we lay needs of this work before thee, that we will indeed know in times of help, even in those seasons of prayer. Be with those that cannot be with us today, whatever their circumstances, and, and we pray that you will draw near unto your dear people. So come among us, humble us.
us in thy presence today. Forgive us of our sins, cleanse us afresh. Going to turn to the front of the hymn book, please, to the Psalm 4. The Psalm 4. And it's on page 6. We're singing from the verse 6 just to the end of the Psalm. Oh, who will show us any good is that which many say, but of thy countenance the light, Lord, lift on us always. And when the Lord's people are in distress, what a blessing to know that it's the Lord that truly. Psalm 4, verse 6 to the end. Genesis 50, verse 15. And when Joseph's brethren saw that their father was dead, they said, Joseph, peradventure, will peradventure hate us, and will certainly requite us all the evil which we did unto him. And they sent a messenger unto Joseph, saying, Thy father did command before he died, saying, So shall ye say unto Joseph, Forgive, I pray thee now, the trespass of thy brethren and their sin. For they did unto thee evil, and now we pray thee, forgive the trespass of the servants of the God of thy father. Joseph wept when they spake unto him. His brethren also went and fell down before his face, and they said, Behold, we be thy servants. And Joseph said unto them, Fear not, for am I in the place of God? But as for you, ye thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good, to bring to pass, as it is this day, to save much people alive. Now therefore fear ye not, I will nourish you and your little ones. And he comforted them, and spake kindly unto them. And we'll turn then to Romans chapter 8, please. Book of Romans. And chapter 8 and we, we will read from verse 26 Romans 8 and verse 26 likewise the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities for we know not what we should pray for as we ought 
But the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. He that searcheth the hearts knowing knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. We know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. And whom he called, them he also justified. And whom he justified, then he also glorified. What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifies. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor height nor depth nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. Amen. We'll end there. The Lord will add his blessing to the reading of his precious truth. Could I again welcome everyone to the meeting this morning. It's good to see each one gathered with us and we trust that the Lord will indeed draw near today and minister to all of our hearts as we come around his word. Now after the service today, uh, both this morning and this evening, uh, there will be a special time of prayer. So each year we set aside in February a day for prayer and fasting. If you're able to fast, we encourage you to do that. If you're not able to do that, that is a problem. Uh, so after uh, the meeting, there will be a few moments while uh, the children get organized for Sunday school. Uh, so there will be tea and coffee at the back if you'd like tea and coffee and the biscuits there uh, for the children who aren't fasting. And uh, then at half 11, there will be the Sunday school, and then after, so during Sunday school rather there will be a prayer time, and then following Sunday school will be another prayer time, and then so said after the meeting this evening as well. So if you're able to stay, we encourage you to do that. If you can only stay for a few minutes and not stay for the full time, and then feel free to stay in the if you need to. The prayer meetings this week will be at the usual times. If you're not able to be here, we encourage you to join us on Zoom. The details for that are in the bulletin. The meetings on Friday at the usual times, and then next Lord's Day, the services at the usual times. And next Lord's Day, I'll be away. Our brother Stephen De Silva will be ministering God's Word in the morning. Appreciate our brother Stephen coming to minister God's Word, and then our brother Bevis will be ministering in the evening time. Do pray for these brethren as they come to next Lord's Day. On Friday morning I'll be going over to Melbourne to visit with my aunt and then next week I'll be attending the Banner of Truth Conference in Sydney. Uh, so I'll be away then for a week or so. I think these are all the announcements except, except to say that there will be a meeting for the congregation at the end of the month. The details for that are in the bulletin and it's not just for members that we ask all the community members to be here, uh, but um, it's open to everyone, so uh, keep that in mind. Details for that are in the bulletin. I think these are all the necessary announcements. We're going to turn again in our hymn books, please, as the offering for the work of the Lord 
is received. 351. 351. When peace like a river attended my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, it is well. It is well. Three hundred and fifty-one, and we will remain seated at the beginning of the hymn the offering for the work of the Lord.
We will turn, please, in God's Word to Romans chapter 8, please. The book of Romans and the chapter 8. I want us to look at verse 28 together today with the help of God. Romans 8, verse 28. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. All things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. We'll seek the Lord's face together, please, in prayer. Let us ask the Lord for his help as we come and meditate upon these beautiful words together. Our gracious Father, we confess how much we do need thy help today. O oh Lord, as we come and look at these words together, we recognize that they're words that are very precious to so many of us. Words that we have proved, yet we ask that they will come with freshness to our hearts today. That we will rejoice in this truth individually, as a congregation, and as a church throughout the world. The Lord works all things for good, for those who love Him, for those who are called according to His purpose. Grant help them, we pray. I recently read a book concerning the abduction and subsequent escape and release of the four missionaries in Colombia in the 1980s. They had been seized by terrorists known as bark gorillas and one escaped by making his way back to his aeroplane and the others were released a couple of weeks later. I was struck in reading the book knowing that I would be coming to speak on this text, I was struck how many times in the early part of the book that this text is referred to. The first two missionaries who were kidnapped had the opportunity to remain in their own home and they were allowed to keep their Bibles while a gunman surrounded the house and kept them under guard. But the book says one verse that stood out in their minds more to them than any other that evening than it had ever done before in Romans 8, verse 28. And the terrorists forced those two missionaries to make a radio call to the base for help. And they were told, you have to say that the husband is sick, that he needs medical help. And so the plane needs to come and to collect him. And so a gun was held to the missionaries' heads as that radio call was made. And so a plane did come, and the, the two pilots in the flight uh, discerned that there was something uh, unusual. But one said to the other, I have come to the conclusion, and I base my life on this fact, that God is not going to allow anything to happen to us that is not for our good. God is not going to allow anything to happen to us that is not for our good. And when those men landed, they also were taken then by these terrorists. And one of the, or sorry, the other pilot then, he thought about what had been said in the plane. Nothing can happen except it is for our good. And the book then talks about how the children of one of the pilots when news came that they had been kidnapped. One of the children had been reading a book back at missionary school that focused on this text, Romans 8, verse 28. And so the child said to his mother, we know that this is all going to work out for good too. And so in that story, independently, there were three occasions when their attention was drawn to this great text. Uh, so one of the pilots later said, if you want me here, 
then I know it's for my good. In 2001, a young 13-year-old boy, Steve Wright, who was from a Christian family, died in the United States in Tennessee. And this young man had trusted the Lord two years earlier. And following their loss, the father sought to encourage others through a number of biblical texts and one of them was this one and he wrote a hymn based upon it the lord is watching over you you're always in his care there's nothing you're facing now of which god is unaware he knows the future like the past he knows each circumstance god ordains your every woe so there's nothing left to chance and so the chorus begins for I believe that in all things God is working in all things God is working and this great text Romans 8 28 it proves to us that practical Christian living cannot be divided from theological truth I'm sure you've often heard that statement I don't want to know about theology I don't want to know about doctrine. I just want to live the practical Christian life. Well, is there any verse more practical in the Bible than Romans 8, 28? We know that all things work together for the good of them that love God. This is a verse that must be taken by us and must be applied to our lives. Is there any verse in the Bible more theological? To them who love God, to those that are called according to his purpose, we're brought there to the great truths of election and effectual calling. And so Thomas Watson called this text a divine cordial. A divine cordial. It's a drink that God's people are to partake. As we take in great theological truths, God's calling, God's sovereignty, God's care, and we apply that to our Christian lives. Interestingly, Watson believed that as a preacher he faced two great difficulties. His first difficulty was to make unbelievers sad. It's hard to bring the unconverted to realize the awfulness of their condition. Can't do that, we need the Holy Spirit. He said the second problem was to make believers happy. And isn't that so true? We struggle to bring the unconverted to see their need to make them sad. But there's also this struggle for the Lord's people to be happy. And I want them to look at this text this morning with the help of God. Uh, the title of the message, A Great Promise for Every Believer. A Great Promise for Every Believer. Uh, I want to say, first of all, with you one great criteria. Uh, for this text is not for all mankind everywhere. This text cannot be proved by each and every individual on the face of the earth. Verse 28, we know that all things work together for good isn't the full stop to them that love God to them who are called according to his purpose to them that love God to them who are called according to his purpose and these two titles then lovers of God those called according to the purpose of God they are describing the same people so those that love God are those who have been called according to God's purpose. And those who have been called according to God's purpose are those that love God. It's the same people that are in view. And now as we come to these words, perhaps you say, well, am I really a lover of God? We know all things work together for good to them that love God. But you say, my love is not what it ought to be. And that is true. Paul is not arguing that the lovers of God have a love that is perfect. 
Cooper said, Lord, it is my chief complaint that my love is weak and faint. And he prayed then, oh, for grace to love the Lord. So our love is not what it ought to be. But those that are called by the Lord do love him. We love him because he first loved us. I should also say that not all who say they love God do love God. There are many unconverted and they will say, I love God. Some will even say, I love Jesus Christ. And yet, the truth is they love their false religion. They have never submitted to the truth of salvation by grace alone in Christ alone. They deny the sufficiency of Christ's work. They have confidence in their own works to open up the door of heaven for them. When they say, I love God, they are liars. You cannot say you love God, but deny the truth of his holy word. You cannot say, I love God, but I defy that God and his truth, and I will seek to make my own way. No. Those that love God are, as Paul describes it here, those that are called. And the called, as we'll see later in the chapter, then are those that are justified. They have been brought to recognize that salvation is not in their hand, but it is grounded in the work of Christ only. And so the Christian treasures this. I love the Lord because he first loved me. And I love that truth that I'm called according to God's purpose. For the believer, the subject of election is not a subject that we are to resent. But rather we are to rejoice in it. That the Lord's mercy was set on a sinner like me. The scripture speaks of Jacob as being an illustration of election. And we'll see that when we come to Romans chapter 9, that Jacob's salvation is one of the great proofs of God's electing love. And isn't it true that Jacob is also an illustration of one who loved God? Yea, one who loved God imperfectly, but yet one who loved God. In Genesis chapter 42, Jacob felt sorry for himself. He was under the delusion that Joseph was dead. His sons had gone to Egypt and they came back without Simeon. And they came back saying, the next time we go to Egypt, we have to take Benjamin with us. And so he said, you have bereaved me of my children. Joseph is not. Simeon is not. And he was being entirely unreasonable in that read no evidence at all that Simeon was dead. And he will take Benjamin away. And he then said, All these things are against me. All these things are against me. In those words, Jacob could not have been further from the truth. And yet, aren't there times that the Lord's people in their struggle, they say, Everything is against me. No dear believer. Everything is for you. Everything, even those things that seem to be against you, they are working for your good. But as we take these words, I've mentioned this criteria. It's only for those that love God. It's only for those that have been called. And there is a sense then in which the opposite is true. For those that do not love God, for those that have not submitted to the gospel, submitted to the gospel of truth, dear unsaved one today, you cannot say all things are working together for good. In your present state, 
And as long as you're outside of Christ, the truth is all things are ultimately working against you. Now you may find that certain troubles in life ultimately come good. And yet that testifies against you. The fact that God has shown you common grace and yet still you reject the Savior. Here is a good thing today that you're in the house of God. You have another opportunity to hear the word of God. But as you harden your heart and reject Christ, all things are working for your greater comfort. <laughs> that you have privilege and yet you despise it. Every sickness, every time you witness death, every suffering that you go through, it's a warning for that which is ahead. If you perish without Christ, it's a warning of the awfulness of hell. And in that sense, then, all things are working against you. Oh, that you would see that today. That you would recognize it's time to repent. It's time to seek the Lord. So there is this one great criteria. Now, I want to see then, secondly, there is one great hand. One great hand. All things work together for good to them that love God. And of course it's the hand of God then that is doing the working to work all these things for our good. And so here there is a great promise. A great promise to lay hold on. And yet we see the great power of God to bring it about. Can you work all things for your good? You may try, but you'll fail. God is in power. And we see God's providence and that the things that so that, that, that seem so contrary, that yet God can work them all for our good. Now some have asked the question, how far can we take this text? We know that all things work together for good. Uh, and so some have put some uh, exclusions. Uh, yet I don't think that's what we're to do. But we know all things. All things. All things. God's hand then is working presently. Uh, today as you sit in God's house, God is fulfilling this text of scripture. God is working all things together for your good. And we're, we are not always aware of it. In fact, most often we are not aware of it. God is working presently. God's hand is working secretly. Isn't this text one of those great mysteries? The secret things belong unto the Lord. Deuteronomy 29 verse 29. We do not know how God works all things for our good. And there are times that we might take an issue and we say, yes, I can see how the Lord used that. And yet the great picture, God is working secretly. But God's hand, praise God, is working harmoniously. It says the, we know that all things work together. Work together. Now while work together is two words in English, it is one word in Greek. And that same word from this form, we get the word fellow laborer. All things are working in solidarity, as it were. All things are working together. And sometimes then, we look at our trials in isolation, we look at our circumstances in isolation. Paul is not merely saying that God is working this one particular trial for your good. God is working everything in your life for your good. All things work together. And Paul then is saying you have to see the bigger picture. And so it's not merely I will work 
and your bereavement for your good, or I will work in your physical suffering for your good. We have to see this harmony. And it's like there's this great pot, as it were, and all events in our lives are in it. All is working together in harmony. As Virgin used the illustration, I think he took it from someone else, of a pharmacist. When a pharmacist is making a drug, he will take this chemical and that chemical and he will mix them together and he gives you the, the drug. And so maybe there's one part sodium, two parts carbon, one part sucrose, three parts chlorine, whatever it might be. When you go to the pharmacy, he doesn't take out five or six bottles and tell you to take a spoonful of each one. If you did so, you'd probably be dead before you get to the sixth one. Because some of those elements in their basic form are poisonous to you. The point is, when they are combined, there is a chemical reaction, there is a change. But when you're given all together, it works for your good. But you're not then to look just at one trial in isolation. It's all things together. All things together for your good. One great criteria, one great hand, and I want to see then thirdly, one great reason. One great reason. We know that all things work together for good. To them who love God. To them who are the called according to his purpose. Isn't that amazing? The Lord does this working. For our good, those of us that love God. For those who are called. God is working for my good. Even though I'm so faithless, even though I'm unbelieving, even though I'm struggling, even though I do not witness for the Lord as I ought, even though I do not pray as I ought, yet still God is working all things for my good. <coughs> Didn't believe in grace, cannot see it in this day. How gracious God is working all things for and my good and this text then is a great weapon against discouragement and let us take it and use it as such in your discouragement maybe even when you're discouraged over yourself take this text and claim it in prayer Lord you have said you will work all things for my good do so even and all that is going on in my present life at this time. As I said, the all things means all things. And so it includes the sweet things. The things that we might ordinarily call good. And perhaps that's obvious and yet we're to think about it. <coughs> all the good things are working for our good. And when the Lord gave the manna in the wilderness... Good things were working for their good. God gives us richly all things to enjoy. God has given salvation for our good. God has given us His Word. God has given us prayer. God has given us fellow believers. God has given us the sacraments of baptism and the Lord's Supper. Therefore, our good. not only the sweet things, there's the sorrowful things. The sorrowful things are for our good. Psalm 119 verse 71, it's good for me that I have been afflicted, that I might learn thy statutes. And it was good that I had that suffering, that I might learn the word of God, that I might see the truthfulness of the word of God. We read earlier concerning the words of Joseph, where he said to his brothers, Ye 
He brought evil against me. And I was suffering. Joseph was sold. He was cast into prison, falsely accused. But God meant it unto good. And Paul speaks of that born in the flesh. That was a sorrowful thing, and yet he knew more of God's grace. He was to prove God's grace to it. We read of Manasseh when he was taken captive to Babylon that he sought the Lord. He humbled himself. The Lord worked the sorrowful things for his good. The sweet things, the sorrowful things. But then there's the satanic things. I mean, for that times of satanic attack and affliction. Even when Satan attacks you and God permits it to be so, as he permitted Satan to attack Job, it is for your good. It is for your good. And again, the thorn in the flesh, Paul says, it was the messenger of Satan. But for his good. The struggling things. Book of Romans, as we see back in chapter 7, it talks about that struggle we have in the Christian life. The good that I would, I do not. We struggle against sin, against the devil, against our own flesh, and yet even that struggle is for our good. The simple things work for our good. It may surprise you. That the Lord is even able to use our sin for our betterment. And that is not to excuse sin. That is not to say, I can go on in my sin because God's going to use it. Remember, David fell into sin with Bathsheba. And for the rest of his life, David suffered because of that sin with Bathsheba. <laughs> Yet when you read Psalm 51, you read David's cry unto the Lord for cleansing. The Lord even took that sin and he used it for David's maturing spiritually. And we have been given Psalm 51. God uses that for our good. The Lord uses our sin to humble us, to see the greatness of grace, to marvel at his mercy. We are unworthy of any good. And yet the Lord works all these things for our good. We looked at the words of verse 26 a few weeks back. We know not what we should pray for as we ought. We don't know what we should pray. But in contrast to verse 28, Paul says we do know. God works all things for our good. We don't understand how it can be so. But Paul says this is our experience. And this is the promise of God. I mentioned before Bernard Gilpin. He was a reformer living during the reign of Queen Mary. He was often referred to as Bloody Mary. Towards the end of her reign, Bernard Gilpin was summoned to London. And he sought to comfort the Lord's people who were concerned for him that he would die the death of the martyr. He said, it's all in the covenant that must be for good. Now during the journey, the horse that Gilpin was travelling on to London fell. And Gilpin his leg broken in that accident. And the enemies, those who had taken him captive, they mocked him. And he replied, even this will work for good. When the soldiers and Gilpin arrived in London, having been delayed by that call, they could hear the bells of London ringing. Inquiry was made as to what the ringing of the bell signified, and they heard the news that Queen Mary was dead. A time of burning for Protestants was 
his antics, the light of the open expand. God worked all things for his good, and most importantly, for God's glory. Why does God work all things for our good? Ultimately, it is that his name may be honored. Ultimately, it is that his name would be glorified, that we would glorify God, and the world around us would be brought to see. They must give glory unto the Lord. As we think of this text, isn't it fulfilled in its greatest sense in the person and work of our Lord Jesus Christ? It was he that the Father ordained to be the Savior, in that sense called according to God's purpose. It was he that truly loved the Father as no man has ever been able to love the Father. We know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. When our Savior came to this world, went through that deep humiliation as he was made unto the law. As he suffered at the hands of men, rejected, despised, as he was brought to Calvary's cross, all things worked together for his good. Because remember, book of Hebrews it says who for the joy that was set before him Christ's desire was to see a seed Christ's desire was to see a people brought into him united to him in grace all things worked for good and for the glory It is on the basis then of that work, the great work of the cross, that all things work for our good. But surely also therein is a great invitation to the Son. That the Lord, in, or, in order to bring a people, would go through all of that. Can you look afresh on Christ and say, Can you look on Christ afresh and say it's meaningless? Oh dear son, come to Christ to make the mercy. May the Lord bless his word to all of our hearts. We'll close, please, with the words of the hymn 442. 442, be gone on belief. My Savior is near and for my relief. Surely. Um, so it's the hymn number 442. We'll sing the verses 1 and 2, 6 and 7. 1 and 2, 6 and 7.
better is sweet the medicine food, no painful at present will cease before long. And then, oh how pleasant, the conqueror's song, our gracious Father, and we thank thee for the truth of thy word that we have considered together this morning. And write it on the hearts of thy dear children, we pray. And we pray for those that are in the midst of valley experiences, that the holy word of truth will be a means of great blessing to them. <coughs> Build up your people, we pray, and through your holy word this day and from this day forward, and be with us throughout uh, this day we ask for and tell in the seasons of prayer uh, so we pray that your blessing will indeed abide upon us we ought to him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to the only wise god our savior be glory and majesty dominion and power both now and ever 